Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series about the 12th century Renaissance. In this episode, we will focus on the scientific and technological achievements of the era. We will first look at the overall recovery which took place in the 1100s, brought about in part by the use of horse collars and windmills in agriculture. During this time of plenty, scholars were able to translate ancient Greek texts, which brought about a revolution in astronomy, and in the increased trade of the era, Europeans encountered a new invention called the compass. The Dark Ages, the 600 years in between the fall of Rome and the era called the High Middle Ages, was traditionally regarded as a time of widespread ignorance, violence, and civil breakdown. In truth, it was a time marked by a cycle of revival and breakdown, with a key example being the Carolingian Renaissance of the 700s, which collapsed into the chaos of the Viking Age during the 800s. But throughout the 900s, powerful lords began consolidating vast estates under their control, creating a relatively stable, if inequitable, society by using the fast-moving cavalry needed to stop foreign invasion and and subjugate peasant farmers. By the 1100s, economic and social life recovered sufficiently for a great growth in intellectual and artistic life called the 12th century Renaissance. A key part of this recovery was simply greater amounts of food. Following the Krakatoa eruption of 536, the Earth's temperature cooled substantially. Indeed, it is estimated that this global cooling and the plague that followed may have caused the deaths of one-third to two-thirds of Earth's population. By 900, a warming cycle called the Medieval Warm Period brought longer, warmer summers to Europe, so even the northern part of the continent enjoyed an almost Mediterranean climate. Likely in part because of these better growing conditions and more peasant stability, new inventions proliferated that allowed for the growing of even more food. One of the most notable examples was the padded horse collar. In the past, horses pulled plows very inefficiently because the harness choked their windpipes as they pulled. However, the padded horse collar pressed against the animal's shoulders instead, thus sparing him choking. Use of the horse collar allowed for the utilization of draft horses not only in farming, but transportation. Since horses moved much faster than oxen, this meant more plowing and more food production. Another important invention to spread during the 12th century was the windmill. It was first recorded as being used in Persia during the 600s, but it spread throughout Europe during the 1100s. Water mills had been used before, but they could only be used with swift moving streams that might not always have enough water in them throughout the year. If water mills were not available or active, peasants had to spend several hours a day grinding grain with cornstones to make flour a brack-breaking task which literally caused vertebra damage to peasant women. Windmills were based on water mills, but with sails radiating from a vertical axis standing in a fixed building, which had openings for the inlet and outlet of wind. Each mill drove a pair of stones directly. A long tail pole stretched to the ground and allowed the miller to slowly turn the mill cap. Feudal lords began building windmills wherever possible, in part to charge people for the privilege of using them. Unfortunately, millers gained a bad reputation for price gouging and even stealing flour than plumping the sacks with grit or sand to hide their thefts. Despite this chicanery, windmills saved peasants a lot of labor and made it possible to grow more food, which in turn led to a growing population and fast-growing trade. Trade brought more contact with the wider world. Until the 12th century, there had been little contact between Christian Europe and the Muslim states of Southwest Asia. Most translations of ancient Greek texts occurred within the East Roman Empire and in time found their way to Persia. Things changed with the multicultural kingdom of Sicily, which was ruled by a Norman court but employed Arab doctors and astrologers to translate Greco-Roman texts. 
However, the most important work was done in Spain, occupied by Muslims since the 700s. Throughout the major cities of Iberia, translations of Arabic versions of ancient Greek texts occurred, with particular attention given to astronomy and mathematics. Indeed, some Arabic words were left untranslated, giving Europe mathematic terms like algebra, zero, and cipher, along with astrological terms like almanac, zenith, and nadir. As these works became available in Greek and Latin, they triggered a revolution in science. Galen's theories about the humors provided a new basis for medieval medicine, and the works of Aristotle proved equally important to medieval astronomy. Medieval theologians worked to bring Aristotle's writings in harmony with Christian theology to create a theory about space which endured until 1500. In this revised Aristotelian view, a motionless Earth was fixed at the center of the universe. Around it moved ten separate transparent crystal spheres. The moon, sun, and the five known planets were believed to be embedded in the first eight spheres, with two more spheres added later to account for changes in the star's positions over the centuries. Medieval Christians believed that the throne of God lay beyond the tenth sphere, with angels keeping these spheres moving in perfect harmony. While we know this theory to be incorrect today, they endured for hundreds of years because they offered a logical explanation for what people saw in the night sky, and they fit neatly with Christian doctrines. Indeed, medieval science was often motivated by a desire to understand and glorify God's work. During the Carolingian Renaissance of the 700s, learning was largely centered on the royal court and in monasteries. Scholars who lived in monasteries were expected to devote their lives to the monastic order, which meant that their works tended to stay within monastic communities. However, the Viking and Magyar invasions of the 800s hit the monasteries especially hard, ironically because their great wealth made them tempting targets for plunderers. So learning diffused to new communities, with universities becoming the new centers of enlightenment. These universities especially took off in Italy, where the city-states stood at the center of a huge trade network, which did business with Muslim sultanates, exchanging European goods for silks and spices. This wealth helped to finance Italian education and also brought Italians into contact with a new invention called the compass, likely created in China before making its way to Southwest Asia via trade networks. A lodestone, or a naturally occurring magnetic ore, was floated on a stick in water. It tended to point towards the direction of the pole star, which tended to be magnetic north. Later experimenters found that an iron or steel needle touched by a lodestone for long enough tended to align itself in a north-south direction. Once sailors determined the direction north, all other directions could be determined. The compass made it possible to take shorter routes going across open water in the Mediterranean rather than simply hugging the coasts. The compass helped to further stimulate Italian trade, Italian wealth, and Italian universities, which in turn helped to further the 12th century Renaissance by spreading scholarship across Europe, and that will be the focus of the next presentation. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.